Um, we're in the presence of the jury. The defendant and attorneys of record are present. Sir, I want to remind you you're still under oath. Mr. Freeze, you may continue with your cross-examination. Thank you. Agent Villada, um, going back to the uh, interview that Dalton Jack gave on July 27, um, you've collected a report on that from Agent George, right? Yes. And you've reviewed that, right? Yes. And that report is all part and parcel of this investigation, at least as of July 27, right? Yes. Do you recall reading in that report that the affair that Dalton Jack had with Jordan Lamb had become sexual? Take that one, Jack Houser, you're saying. Sustained. That report uh, was part of your investigation and led you down certain paths in your investigation, right? Correct. And because of that report and what was said in that report, you acted in conformance with uh, the information contained in that report, right? Yes. I mean, you get information, then you take the next step, right? Yes. And because of that information in that report, you took the next step, right? Yes. And because uh, of that report, uh, information in that report, what was the next step you took uh, regarding Dalton Jack's affair with Jordan Lamb? You know, I, I don't know. Maybe, I, again, I could only guess that maybe Jordan Lamb was Lamp or was uh, interviewed, okay. but I don't remember exactly. Dalton Jack, in, uh, in his interview with, with Matt George, indicated that if Molly knew it had become sexual, she would have broken up with him, right? No, Mom, Jack calls for speculation here. Overruled. I think Molly knew about Jordan, and I think she had forgiven him, so I don't know why Dalton Jack would have said that in that interview. Okay. And where'd you get that information? I think from several people. I think her, I think her family even knew about it, but I, I can't say exactly. I just, my recollection is, is that that was no surprise to Molly that that happened, and she had forgiven him okay. over it. In the course of your investigation, did you learn that the Jordan Lamb affair had happened more than once? I, I think you're right on that, yes. Okay. And she had forgiven him once and then it happened again? I don't know about that. I, it was my um, perception that she knew about the entirety of it and had forgiven him. Okay. So let, let's go back to the theory that Mr. Behena, that you developed that, she, that she, Molly was killed by Mr. Behena, okay? Now, is it your assertion that Molly was killed on 385th Street? I don't know exactly where she was killed. Okay. Um, but it's your assertion that she was abducted on 385th Street? <coughs> yes. Okay. Um, Would you agree with me, given your experience, that this was a uh, violent death for Molly Tippetts? Yes, it was. Somebody stabbed her multiple times, correct? That's correct, yes. Would you agree with me that she was stabbed with a significant amount of force? That would be a better question for the uh, pathologist. You understand that the weapon that was used to kill Molly Tibbetts, uh, essentially at least pierced her skull, right? Yes, it did. In your training and your education and your experience, um, that would take a significant amount of force, wouldn't you agree? Uh, yes, yes. So whoever did this didn't do it with a, a butter knife, right? Um, again, the pathologist could answer that, that better. I don't know if they, I can't remember if they had an opinion on what type of knife it would be. Okay. In your experience with violent crimes, um, you've seen violent crimes like this before, I assume? Yes. Um, would it fit the experience that you have that whoever committed this crime uh, did so out of, out of a rage? Um, so I don't actually object to that. But, um, 
that does cause or a call for speculation. Sustained. Do you have training and experience in that area? In the area of what? Uh, interpreting wound patterns, causes of death, and the behavior behind it. I would say, yeah, based on experience more so than anything. Okay. And you, are you comfortable giving an opinion based upon your experience in law enforcement as to the person who stabbed Maui Tibbetts? what their motivation may have been. I'm going to object to any speculation by this witness or really any other concerning what a person's actual motivation may have been. Okay. Uh, this time I want to overrule it in the sense that the question posed asks for a yes or no answer right now. So the witness can answer that and we'll go from there. And can you repeat the question then? Can you read it back please? I would say there's, whenever we have a violent crime, especially one like this, I think you could give several opinions as to why someone, uh, someone acted the way they did. Okay. And given your experience in violent crimes, you're comfortable giving us those opinions? I mean, I could speculate on a couple different reasons why people act the way they do. Could anger be one of those? It could be. You uh, talked about going through Maui's phone records. Some of those phone records included conversations with Dalton Jack, right? Correct. Those are part of the case file. Yes. And you looked at those closely uh, in the course of your investigation, right? The, yes, they were analyzed very closely, yes. There's a lot of conversations between her and Dalton Jack, right? Yes. A lot of conversations where Dalton Jack uh, admits to having anger problems, aren't there? If I'm object, calls for uh, hearsay. Overruled. Um, again, I, as a case agent, we assign people to certain tasks. So um, while, while I would have a general overall knowledge of the case, um, I wasn't the one that would have went through those phone records sp specifically. Well, so. you, ju you just told me they were looked at very closely. Right. Would you agree with me that if Dalton Jack had admitted to having anger problems, that would be something that you as case agent would want to know? Um, well, I did know that, but if it's in the Celebrite uh, dump, then that would be true. Okay, my question was, as case agent, you would want to know if this man who's closest to Molly had anger problems. Yes, of course. And why would you want to know that? Uh, again, it goes back to victimology. It would go back to people closest to Molly and who she, she is associating herself with. And in your training and experience, the people who commit crimes like this are typically those closest to your victim, right? Yeah, a high percentage of the time a victim knows their attacker. Okay. And again, do you have any evidence that Molly Tibbetts knew Christian Bahena? We had no evidence that they knew each other, no. Dalton Jack and these text messages uh, that were reviewed uh, referred to times where he went psychotic, didn't he? Judge, again, I'm going to object. Uh, I'm going to expand this to relevance in the time frame with regard to any of these comments that uh, he's examining Agent Valletta about. Sustained. What about relationship problems between Dalton Jack and Molly Tibbetts? Those would be very relevant in your investigation, correct? That's correct. And if Molly Tibbetts were talking about breaking up with Dalton Jack within a month before the uh, disappearance, that would be relevant to you, right? Yes, and I also thought that they were planning on getting engaged maybe that next weekend or the weekend after. Okay. So. But the question I had is, if, if Molly Tibbetts was talking about severing the relationship a month before she disappeared, that would be something you would want to explore in detail, correct? And I did say yes yeah, previously. And why is that? Um, it's, again, it's um, at the early stages of the investigation, that's something, uh, relationship issues is something that's very relevant to the case. 
and as soon as three days before Molly Tibbetts uh, went and disappeared, there were text messages again talking about Dalton Jack and Molly Tibbetts having relationship issues. Do you recall seeing those? Uh, again, if it's in the uh, text messages, that would be true. And that's relevant to your investigation? It would have been at the time, yes. Okay. But you ruled out Dalton Jack because he was in Dubuque? He was in Dubuque, yes. And you say that because his boss told you he was in Dubuque? His boss and his roommate, yes. Okay. Now, his roommate is a young man named Brandon Gordy, right? Yes. Now, Brandon Gordy told you he was in the room with Dalton Jack that night? Um, I don't know if that's specific, uh, what he says, but he did say Dalton was in the room that night. Because okay. have you also reviewed the interviews with Dalton in law enforcement where Dalton said Brandon Gordy was out of the room until like 5 in the morning smoking pot? I, yeah, I, I do remember uh, Brandon Gordy had left uh, for a while to, to do that, yes. Okay, so yes. you're relying on Brandon Gordy's vouching for Dalton Jack, right? No, that's there. We collected all uh, different kinds of information to show okay. Dalton Jack was in Dubuque. Well, Agent George asked him for receipts and he couldn't produce receipts, could he? Uh, well, he didn't have receipts, no. Okay, so he, he was asked for receipts and couldn't produce them is the question. I, and I said no. Okay. Yes. Um, he's, Dalton Jack talked about being outside drinking beer and playing bag games with his buddies at the hotel, right? Um, I was told he said that during his testimony now, but I think he told us back then that it was, he was in his room. Okay. Um, so his testimony here at trial is different than what he told officers? I didn't, I didn't see his testimony only from what I've heard. Um, the, I think, um, again, I can only speculate as to why he was mixed up on what he was doing. Okay. But if he testified that way, like you just talked about, if he was outside the room playing bags and drinking beer, that's different than your understanding of what he told law enforcement. It, it was my understanding that he was in his room that night. Okay. Who got the surveillance video from the hotel? I don't think the hotel had surveillance video. Was the hotel asked? I think, yes. Okay. Was there ever a report created on that? Um, if there was, it would be in, in my case file. Okay. Uh, bank records of Dalton Jack were uh, retrieved? Yes. Wow. And nothing from those bank records showed him in Dubuque on July 18th, did it? That's not true at all. Okay. Um, Do, am I done answering? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Question. Now, Mr. Brown talked to you about Wayne Cheney. Wayne Cheney uh, came to your attention uh, partially because someone called and gave a tip, right? Yes. And that tip was that he was known to stalk women, right? Yes, and I think the sheriff's office also knew that already too. So somebody who was known to have a violent tendency toward women was someone that the sheriff's office uh, would bring to your attention and someone you'd want to know about. Right, yes. And he was also within that southeast quadrant of the county where you were really focusing your investigation. Yes. Did you ever receive a tip regarding Ron Pexa? Yes, we did. And who gave you that tip? I believe it was his ex-wife. Okay, and when was that given? Um, it's relatively later in the investigation. I don't recall the exact date. Okay, and did you go talk to Ron Pexa? Yes, we did. Who's we? Um, I, I seem to remember I was out there. Um, I don't remember. I think there was two or three of us that were there that day, though. Okay, now Mr. Pexa's in law enforcement, right? He's a Yes, he's a reserve deputy, I think, in Tama County. Okay, any reserve deputy to this day, right? I don't know. You might be right. He might still be there, okay. yes. 
Did you uh, record your interview with Mr. Pexa? No. Why not? Um, because again, when we, um, it was not uncommon for this case for us to make contact with someone before we did the deep dive and, and full interview with them. Um, it wasn't, uh, uh, the, the tip was unusual. Uh, to, and uh, again, I think at that time our resources were starting to dwindle a little. So um, just like with everybody else we did, we would um, try to figure out who they were, where they were at, and then um, using all our resources do a deep dive into that type of person. So, Well, your files indicate that you first got a tip about Ron Pexa with a call to the Sheriff's Office on July 22. Okay. And that was before you got there, right? No, you got there on the 20th, didn't you? I did get there on the 20th, yes. And at 6.59 p.m., an anonymous caller said, although the caller gave her phone number, a male by the name of Ron Pexa from Guernsey, who has been founded to have sexual acts with children, and this person was concerned about him being in the area. Judge, this is uh, anonymous caller is hearsay. Sustain. Did you did you ever receive a call on July 22 regarding Ron Pexa? I don't recall a day, but I know Ron Pexa's name, and I know that we'd been out to his house. I know. Well, do you recall how many times you got tips on Ron Pexa? Okay, so no, I don't, but I know um, when we got leads like that, eventually they were assigned and, and run out. Okay. If you would have got a, a lead on 722.18, would you have assigned someone to that lead? Um, yes. I mean, a, event, I, I, well, it was assigned a lead at some point, I would assume, yes. Okay. Let's pull up exhibit P. Thank you. Agent Villada, I've put in front of you a, a document um, for the purposes of refreshing your recollection. Uh, if you look at page two of that document and read it to yourself, just the first, uh, first two paragraphs. Okay. Having done so, is your refreshing, refre uh, recollection refreshed? Yes. And now, on July 22, 2018, did you or your law enforcement receive a tip about Ron Pexa? Yes. Now, tell me what was done in relation to that tip. Um, like I said, we uh, um, at some point we had made it out to to his residence to talk to him again. Um, anytime we had a lead, and with all the resources that we had, um, 
I can confidently say Ron Pex's name was was uh, talked about quite a bit after that tip came in. This is around the same time you're interviewing Wayne Cheney, right? Yes. Um, you had all the resources of the FBI, right? Right. And I think your word was that their resources were basically unlimited, right? Yes. Okay. And we have no report of an interview with Ron Pexa, right? I don't, I don't know if we ever did a formal interview, no. You probably would not. Okay. Did you also receive a uh, report concerning Ron Pexa following a canvas on August 1, 2018? If there's a canvas report regarding Ron Pexa, then that would be yes. yes. If I showed you that canvas report, would it refresh your recollection? Yes. That would be. Uh, putting in front of you now an activity log, if that would refresh your recollection, please let me know. Okay. Now that, that's an activity log that was kept in your case file, right? Yes. And that activity log refreshes your recollection, right? Yes. And that activity log indicates that the residents at 610 West Brooklyn, West Street in Brooklyn, gave information about Ron Pexa, right? That's correct, yes. And they indicated that uh, Ron Pexa had been and it, a person who had harmed children and women in the past. Yes, that's what this, how this reads, yes. Okay. Um, this tip that received on August 1, 2018, also indicated that Ron Pex's home had a hidden room, right? Yeah, yes. I'm going to object to this. Not relevant. Overruled. Go ahead. Yes, the, the report here says there's a hidden room. And that room concealed edged weapons, right? Judge it, again, object to relevance. Same rule, no rule. Yes, that's what it says. And that Mr. Pexa had threatened women, specifically his ex-wife, with death and burial, right? Objection to hearsay and relevance. Sustained on that hearsay. Remind the jury how far from Ron Pexa's house Molly Tibbetts' body was found. Uh, so it, I think it's the adjacent property. The fence line to Ron Pex's property was within 100 yards from where Molly Tibbetts was found? It's probably close, yes. And, and Ron Pex's house, quarter mile maybe, from where her body was yeah. found? Yeah, that would be, that would be close, yeah. What did Ron Pex have to say after you discovered Molly Tibbetts' body? You didn't talk to Ron Pexa after Molly Tibbetts' body was found, did you? No, we didn't need to. You didn't find it a bit ironic that this man who you have two tips on, on, the body was found a quarter mile from his house? Objections argumentative. Overruled. I would say Christian Rivera cleared Ron Pexa question was, you didn't find it a bit ironic that this man you'd received at least two tips on? The body was found a quarter mile from his house? No, not at all. Did you also receive a tip from a canvas on August 3, 2018 regarding Ron Pexa? Yes. Okay. And if I've showed you an activity log dated 8 3 2018, would that refresh your recollection? I think that's what I'm looking at right now. Okay. Yes. Is, it, is it refreshing your recollection? Yes. Now, in that activity log and in that tip, again, Ron Pexa is uh, said to uh, have a torture room in his home, right? I'm about to object. It's a call for 
speakers say it's not relevant. This is all speculation provided by somebody else that provided information to the investigation. Overruled. This report says he has a torture room in his basement. Okay. And they gave you the address of 2410460th. Yes. Now, so twice you have these allegations on Mr. Pexa. Is that when you decided to follow up on it? Again, I, th this was a very large investigation. Um, my exact thinking or any of the other investigators' exact thinking it would be hard for me to recall. Okay. But we did go out to Ron Pex's house. I know we walked through there. Um, we did not find a torture room or anything like that. Okay. But you didn't create a report on it? No, we did not create a report on that. Didn't re record the interview on it? No. Is he the only law enforcement officer you interviewed in this case? Uh, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. Possibly. Yes. You mean there could be other ones you're forgetting? Um, we interviewed hundreds of people. If someone was a reserve or something like that, I, I, uh, it, that's possible, yes. Are there other people you interviewed you didn't create a report on? No. Just Ron Pexa? Yeah, we didn't necessarily do the full interview. We just walked through his house. It was almost like a canvas. Yes. Okay. Did you tell Ron Pexy you had these uh, allegations against him? If my memory serves right, I think he almost guessed as to why we were there. Now, Mr. Brown asked you about Jackson Eichhorn. Remember that? Yes. What was the information that put Jackson Eichhorn on your radar? I'm not sure how it happened. I think it was through a, um, like a Google fence warrant that maybe put his phone in that area. The um, but Google, I think that's how we got him. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Google did a thing called a, a geofence, right? Right. Um, and what Google can do is they can set up uh, kind of a, a net over an area and pick up anybody's phone who's on Google or any of Google's like Gmail or Google Docs, stuff like that, right? Yeah, you're explaining it better than I can, but that sounds <laughs> correct, thank you. I had to do research. <laughs> okay. Um, so anybody who's using Google on their phone uh, under this dome or under this net that they set up they can pinpoint that person, right? Um, yeah, it's uh, like a cell phone ping or something. Yeah, but again, you seem to be explaining it better than I can. So, and um, Jackson Icorn's phone was determined to be in the cemetery near 385th Street around the time Molly Tibbetts would have been jogging. That's correct. Yes. Okay. So that made him of interest, right? Yes. Did Jackson Icorn have any connection to Dalton Jack? Um, we always kind of assumed that the younger people would all know each other. I can't remember if they were actually friends or even knew of each other, but, um, and I also seem to think there were a lot of icorns in the area, but I can't remember exactly if they were friends or not. So. He was interviewed, right? Yes, he was. And you reviewed the reports of that interview? Yes. And, uh... I'm trying to recall. Do you recall who did that interview? I would. I probably would guess Matt George did that. Okay. Um, he seemed to be doing most of the people of interest interviews. Okay. Now, Jackson Icorn was about 17 at the time, I think. That, yes, he was. And uh, when he was interviewed, he, he agreed that he was in the cemetery. Do you recall that? Yes. And he gave some excuse or explanation, I should say, that he was there helping a friend <coughs> Uh, mow the cemetery for a bit. Right, yes. Okay. yes. Um, he identified that friend. Do you recall the friend's name? No, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I think he said he was there helping someone mow the cemetery, but I don't remember the friend's name. I think the friend might be Darian Davis. I, yes, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, 
But then when he was, he cut off the interview. He stopped the interview, right? Right. Uh, but he was interviewed again about a week later. That, that, that sounds correct, yes. And then his story changed. Yes. He recalled then he was just kind of driving through the cemetery hanging out. Um, I thought he said he was like smoking marijuana or something, but maybe in, yeah, maybe the car thing is correct, yeah. Okay. Um, when the canvases were being done down on 460th, um, who were the agents that were doing the canvases, do you recall? Okay, so our canvas teams were, were different daily. It always depended on who we had or um, uh, we always played to our strengths. So we didn't want to send our people that understood phones sure. out on canvas. So it was always, um, it'd be really hard for me to guess who that would have been. It would have been who we had and who didn't have anything to do that day. Okay. So. Um, did you review the uh, records of the canvas on 460th? Um, someone in the investigative team did. I can't say that I reviewed all the canvas sheets. There was a cemetery on 460th. Probably still is, actually. <laughs> but there's a cemetery on 460th? It, I, I seem to remember something like okay. that, yes. Okay. Who is Curtis Laver? Curtis Laver. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, Curtis Laver... We looked at briefly, I think he had a, he met Molly, like he had friends that had a pool party and he was there and met, maybe met Molly at that pool party, something like that. Okay. How about Timothy, is it Tometic? Tometic? Tometic, yes. What's the story with him? You looked at um, him. Yeah, he, uh. Judge, I'm going to object if he's going to repeat what Mr. Tometic would have said as uh, hearsay. I think the question's a bit vague. Well, I would say we're not there yet. So to the extent the witness can, he can answer this question at this point. And, um, okay, yeah. Um, Tomatich uh, just had done some unusual things around the time of Molly's disappearance that we needed to follow up on. And then came a lead to a guy named Michael Scott. You recall that? Michael, yes, I do. He was the guy who was passing through town whose car broke down, right? His car broke down in Brooklyn, yes. That's and you received some tips that uh, this car may have been suspicious, right? Um, I don't know if it was a tip or one of our agents develop, developed that somehow, but I remember the agent coming to me talking about that car. Yes. And they found a brown hair in that car? Uh, yes, they did. Yes. And uh, the circumstances were he came to Brooklyn, his car broke down, left his car there and bought a new one and kept on traveling, right? Yes, he did, yes. Which seemed kind of bizarre. Oh, it was very unusual, yeah. And then the DCI went out and got a GPS warrant to put a GPS on Mr. Scott's car? Right, yes. And is that how you excluded him? Exclude, no. You, how'd you exclude Mr. Scott? Um, he went, he actually made it out to, I think, Omaha, if we're talking about the same person. Um, I don't, there's a different way, I guess you're asking how we excluded people. There was really only a couple that we actually excluded. We revisited a lot of these people several times. Just not Dalton Jack? Uh, we did revisit Dalton Jack. How about the idea that um, Powashik County has a number of sex offenders residing in it? Yes, they do. And you run all those people down? Yes. Everyone? Um, the ones that we knew of, yes. So on the sex offender registry in Powashik County, you ran everyone down? I think so, yes. There was a gentleman named Brandon Roller that piqued your interest, right? Yes. What I piqued your interest about Brandon Roller? Um, I don't know specifically. I, I remember, though, the name vividly. When you said earlier the FBI had uh, unlimited resources, basically, uh, you were using whatever resources you could get your hands on to find Molly Tibbetts, right? Yes, we were. And uh, Nick Potritz was kind of in control of that? Um, yeah, he would be the best uh, resource for what the FBI did, yes. Was he a part of the behavioral an analyst unit? No. 
was the behavioral analyst unit consulted during this? Yes. And that uh, was primarily a woman named Molly Amon? Okay, so Molly Amon used to be in that unit. She was no longer at that time. She okay. was a supervisor out of Des Moines. Okay. But the behavioral analyst unit was consulted? Yes. Did you yourself consult with them? Um, I talked to them. Um, again, we played our strengths. So Molly Ammon used to be in that unit. So um, I think she had most of the contact because she would know what they're capable of or what questions to ask and that sort of thing. Tell the jury what the behavioral analyst unit is. Wow. Um, okay, so it's like... Um, uh, Actually, I'm going to object to this. It's just, I mean, this agent's not part of that unit. Um, whatever he's going to tell us would be s speculation. Um, I just I think we're just getting far afield here. With he's going to be speculating with regard to uh, what she does or what she did do with the behavioral science unit. On both speculation and relevance, uh, I will sustain the objection. The meetings with this unit. These are the profilers, right? Um, my only contact with them is usually to ask them how to ask questions on certain people. They were giving you certain investigative tactics to use, right? I'm going to object to relevance again. Sustained. Going back to Dalton Jack's home at 622 West Des Moines Street, um, Molly had a computer. Yes, she did. It was a MacBook? Yes. Made by Apple. Yes. And was that forensically examined? Um, if you're referring to like dumped or made copies of, no. So you had information, did you not, that Molly was on her computer that night? She was uh, abducted? We did, and we later found out I think it was her brother that knew her password. Okay. So her brother went on her computer to try to find a, a trail, right? Right. Now, if you're working victimology inside out, you didn't want to get on a computer to find out who she'd been talking to or where she may have gone? I think we're on her computer almost every day. We had a password. We had uh, her charger, and then the FBI had uh, agents, investigators that were actually like software engineers in a previous life. So whenever we needed access to any information on Molly's computer, we had it. So, but you didn't have it forensically looked at for deleted files or file carving, nothing like that? I don't know what file carving is, but um, the FBI software guys were constantly on that analyzing stuff. So that wasn't necessary? I, again, I don't know what file carving is or if it would be necessary or not. Did the FBI software engineers or whoever have it indicate that Molly had a pen pal? Yes, she did. Did you figure out who the pen pal was? Um, I think so. I don't remember the name, but I think at some point we figured it out, but I'm not sure. Did you interview the pen pal? I don't think so, no. Wasn't there some concern that Molly was sharing personal information with this pen pal, but the pen pal was unknown? Jack calls for speculation is irrelevant. Overruled, the witness may answer if he knows. I I can't remember exactly. Um, I think the pen pal was a younger person, like a younger kid or something, but I could very well be wrong on that. That's something you'd want to know, wouldn't you? Um, yes, I mean, we tried to figure out everybody in Molly's life. Again, though, um, some I could not possibly know everything and all the analysis, so um, maybe the FBI would figure that out at some time. It would probably be a better question for Nick Potritz. Okay. Um, was it you who directed the criminalist to uh, take swabs and look for uh, signs of seminal fluid? Where? On Molly's body, Molly's clothing. Um, okay, so the pathologist, um, Dr. Klein, would be would call me and ask kind of what they would want done. In a case like this, it kind of goes without saying that that would be something that um, they would look for. 
Okay. So in a case like this, the theory always is that sexual assault is possible. Right. right. Yes. Okay. So tell me, when in your mind did the investigation into Molly Tibbetts' murder basically end for you? When did it end? It, well, when we were able to uh, corroborate all the facts within Christian Rivera's confession. Okay. It Was it over when the DCI reports were submitted to you showing a mixture of three different individuals' DNA in the trunk? Again, that's kind of a complicated answer. The, the, the purpose of looking for Molly Tibbetts' blood or DNA in the trunk was basically to corroborate the statement made by Christian Rivera that he takes her out of the truck. So, trunk. So when he says, I took her out of the trunk and she was bleeding, and we find that blood in the trunk, that made the statement that he gave us true. So the reason why we were looking for Molly Tibbetts' blood in the trunk was to show that Christian Rivera was telling us the truth. But when we get additional facts, like a mixture of three individuals' blood or a fingerprint that's not Christian Bahena's, we don't care to look? Um, well, Christian, Christian Rivera didn't say anybody else helped him, so I don't know um, what the a DNA would be much more, um, in my understanding, DNA is much more conclusive than a fingerprint. Did you ever interview Ulysses Felix? Again, that's a name I've heard, but I can't remember why they, why I know that name. Okay. You'd agree with me that no DNA from Christian Bahena was ever found on Molly Tibbetts' body? Yeah, she was very decomposed. There was no DNA there. Um, no DNA was ever found from under her fingernails? No, there was not. And you understand that uh, there are defensive wounds found on her body, right? Um, yes. Okay. You, when you went to Yerby Farms, you took, or you ordered to have buckle swabs taken from all the employees, right? Yes. Why? Um, I think I kind of explained in my direct. Um, I mean, there was talk, a uh, political talk of uh, deporting millions of good, hardworking people just because of their immigration status. And we had this huge fear that if we had contact with um, an immigrant community that they wouldn't trust us or that they would uh, be afraid of us, probably rightly so. I wouldn't have blamed them, I guess. But um, they're a transit community. They're able to move from town to town and use... Um, false paperwork, that sort of thing. It was purely getting the buckle swaps was purely for identification purposes. And that was, um, um, we wanted, we took very, very uh, careful steps to make sure they knew it wasn't about immigration. So your theory was you wanted to take DNA from these folks in an attempt to, to make them trust you? No, 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 that's not what I said. I said, in case they were to leave the area and we needed to talk to them at some other point, pro probably our only real um, uh, way of knowing who they were would be through DNA. Um, there were several people there that, for instance, asked us, uh, do you want my real name or the name I'm working under? Um, I, I think Christian Rivera had a, a false paperwork that he used to work there. So it was merely a form of feeling comfortable that we knew who we, we were talking to. These people you interviewed, uh, no individual gave you a indication that Christian Rivera was violent, right? Did you have an objection proper character evidence? Sustained. Mr. Brown asked you on direct examination that uh, you were asking these people about Christian Rivera, right? Right. And they were giving you his demeanor and how he acted, correct? Um, yes. And they all told you he acted normal, right? Right. I think I want to object to the form of questions. Is vague. Uh, Mr. Freeze, I am going to sustain that and simply ask you that you rephrase that one. 
please tell me um, the description that was given uh, about Christian uh, generally. You're saying overruled. Go ahead. Um, I mean, well, that's another. It's kind of a tough question. I think everybody kind of has a different perception of people that they meet. So um, I just don't remember hearing uh, anything negative. I guess. Well, let me po- Christian Rivera. Let me posit it this way: If someone had told you something negative about Christian, you'd remember that. Right. Yes. If someone told you he was violent, you'd remember that. Yes. If someone told you he was known to carry weapons, they, you'd remember that. Yes. Didn't you? Don't remember any of that. Um. N- nobody at the farm told us that that I can recall. Now, you went to great steps to make sure these folks knew that you weren't going to get them in trouble with immigration, right? Yes. And that's because these folks take great steps to not be detected, right? Um, yeah, I mean, our immigration system makes it hard for them to, to, yeah, I would agree with that, yes. Would you agree with me these folks come here and work and they perhaps work under fake names and stuff and the whole purpose is to not be detected? objects calls for speculations, not relevant. Sustained. Were you able to look at work records for Christian Bahena? Yes. And those work records showed you he was working 12 out of every 14 days, right? That seems right, yes. And he was working about 12 hours a day, right? Yes. And he was working under a a false name? Correct, yes. And it wasn't like he was working under a Hispanic name, he was working under an Anglo name, right? Yes, I think it was John Budd is that he was working under. Now I want to go to the interview. Um, you made the decision to use Pamela Romero, right? Right. Now, were you aware she was an officer for two and a half years? Um, yes, I was. Were you aware she had 16 hours of interrogation training? Um, I was aware of the class that she went to. I don't, I've never been in that class. I know it's a good one, but I'm, uh, yeah, I know she was very limited in experience. Now, you yourself are a very experienced interviewer, right? Yes. And I think Nick Potratz was there as well for the yes. FBI? Yes, he is. He's a very experienced interviewer, right? Right. Jeff Fink was there as well? Yes. And he's a sergeant with the Coralville Police Department, right? He's uh, with Iowa City Police. Iowa City and Police. And he is a sergeant, yes. Um, was he Pamela Romero's supervisor? Yeah, I think he was her field training officer or supervisor is one of the two, yes. He was an experienced interviewer. Yes. Fluent in Spanish, right? Um, Okay, so this is something that I learned. He says he's proficient, which evidently is different than being fluent. Pamela Romero was fluent, proficient, uh, is different. I'm not quite sure how. And she's fluent because she tells you she's fluent. It was, yes. Okay. Jeff Fink tells you he's proficient because he's educated and uh, teaches it, right? He teach. I don't know what he teaches. But out of all the people that were there, it was your decision to send in Pamela Romero to talk to Christian. So the the initial um, interview was Jeff Fink and Pamela Romero. Yes. Why did you choose the officer with the least amount of training and interrogation techniques to do this? Um, that's how it evolved. So it evolved because um, Christian Rivera became engaged with her. He seemed to uh, feel more comfortable with her. And um, often um, in these investigations, we have to make a kind of a gut call and go with our, our, our instincts. Um, obviously, the experience is a concern of ours, but as long as he's engaged with her, and talking to her, uh, we were still able to manage um, the interview somewhat. Um, but Nick Potrat said I did not speak Spanish, so we, um, the reason why we took as many breaks as we did um, was for her to fill us in on what he was saying and for us to do follow-up questions so, with her. So you were still the man behind the curtain controlling the interview from the law enforcement <laughs> standpoint? Yeah, I mean, within reason. I mean, without being able to speak Spanish, um, I could only give general questions. Um, I definitely didn't 
understand all or get all the information that was being told to her. Were you aware at some point that Christian's family uh, came to the sheriff's office? Um, yes, I think they did at some point. Yes, that's true. Were you aware at some point they requested to speak to him? That they did? Yes. Um, I, I don't remember that, no. <clears throat> In your training and experience, is it good practice for an officer to act as both interviewer and then be a translator? Now, um, I, I've been doing this like 26 years and I have yet to figure out a good way to do a uh, foreign language interview. It's, they're difficult. And um, the optimal I think would be to have a highly experienced investigator that speaks the language. Um, but it's it's hard it, um, when if I were to sit there the flow is very um, choppy um, it's I think it's hard even for the person being questioned to, uh, to uh, um, I guess get in the flow of the interview for lack of better words you could have though you had Ms. Romero in the room providing translation and you could have done the interview Right, and we've done that before in different cases. It's just, it's very, um, it, I just don't like doing it that way, I guess is the best way I can say it. In watching the interview, you acknowledged there were times where Mr. Behena fell asleep? Um, I know he fell asleep. I don't know if I watched it, um, but I know he did fall asleep, yes. Okay. He was clearly tired. Yes, we were all tired, yes. Were you ever able to determine if Mr. Bahena had prior law enforcement contact? Um, I, I don't know that answer. No. Okay. That's Mr. all I have. Let me stop you there. We need to take another recess. Members of the jury, we're going to take a 10 minute recess. I want to remind you of your admonition. The uh, hall has been cleared, so you may exit at this time. Please leave your notebooks on your chairs. Thank you. Sorry, you can step down.